uh, and that I never knew, I never understood. And that's really the whole reason why we do what we do, is to be students of the Word. The more we know the Word, the more we know the Father. Amen? And so that's what we're going to continue to do tonight. Uh, as I had said, when we opened up this series, I was going to talk about a, a couple of women in the Bible. And so tonight we'll, we'll continue this uh, in the book of Esther. The book of Esther is great because in the, in the Bible, there's only two books that are written about women and named for the women. So we spoke about Ruth. Now we're going to look at the story of Esther. Tonight's going to be a little bit more foundational uh, than deep, deep. We'll have more deep as we, we continue the series. Uh, but tonight, I believe it's important that we understand some of the foundations in the book of Esther that we don't just simply gloss over everything uh, in the reading of it, which sometimes happens because it's a short book, and it makes for a great TV drama. It really does. If you think about uh, the many books in the Bible, the book of Esther is literally written for television or for movies. It's, it's you know, the, the down uh, and trodden that somehow finds themselves in the palace. You know, it's, it's, it's the old Disney movies, not the stuff they have now. So it's a, it would be a classic if you were to take this and put it into a movie. And there's also very interesting things about this book because, number one, this book is written in a patriarchal uh, system. Uh, not only is the Hebrew Bible usually viewed as a patriarchal uh, book because it's written by men, and it's mostly about a lot of men, not exclusively, uh, but now we're going to read about a woman who is in a, a culture, a Babylonian culture, a Syrian culture, which is completely men are dominant. Uh, in, the, in the Jewish and the Hebrew culture, uh, women are not completely subservient. They are actually considered in many ways a co-equal, but not uh, in this story. In this story, for her to be where she is, is a true blessing of God. It's a true sovereign move of God. And so that's the message that we're going to talk about today. Uh, God uses uh, her to literally save his people. This is the only woman in the entire Bible that God uses to save his entire people. Nowhere else will you find that. Even the mother of Jesus was not there to save. She gave birth to the Savior, but she didn't do something that actually saved. In this book, God does that. Another thing that's intriguing about the book of Esther is the fact that uh, it is not a book mentioned anywhere in the Old or New Testament, and it's also a book that never mentions the God explicit, uh, the name of God explicitly in it. Nowhere in the whole book will you ever see Yahweh or Jehovah, any names of God mentioned in the book. So why would God put this particular story in his book? I find that intriguing. If he doesn't talk about God, and it doesn't have God talking, and it doesn't specifically uh, call out a predecessor or something of Jesus, why would that be in the book? Has anyone ever thought those, or is it only me? Maybe I'm just getting I'm just overdoing it. Well, so tonight we're going to cover some of that, and we're going to look at some of that, and we're going to see uh, through these next uh, few weeks why it is that God has given us this wonderful book uh, with the life of this woman. So just to kind of set the scene, because I think it's very important, because this is a historical book. Not only is it a historical book given in the Bible, but you can literally go to Babylonian records and it records much of these same details in the Babylonian records themselves. So it's validated by extra biblical texts. I always love when God does that. People say, oh, it's only in the Bible. Well, not this story. This story is literally written in the history of another people group. And so it makes it intriguing. It occurs over the span of about 10 years, which is from 483 to 473 B.C. during the reign of Xerxes the first, or Xerxes the Great is what he's known as. And he reigned from 486 to 465 B.C. The event, events occur, just for those Bible buffs or for those novices, these events occur between the 6th and 7th chapter of Ezra. So if you ever read through the book of Ezra and there you get to this point, you're like, 
what's going on there in all this time? From chapter 6 to chapter 6, there's a big gap. What's, what, what's occurring? Well, this is one of the stories that's occurring during the time of Ezra. And so that's a great way to tie the two together. This book is also important because for the Hebrew people, they still celebrate today a holiday known as the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim is to commemorate the day that God delivered his children from the hand of Haman. And of course, we'll talk about Haman a little bit more as we go through this study. And so it's written not in the Bible. But the account of the Feast of Purim, though it, there's a reference in Scripture, uh, but the main thing that's spoken about is in Second Maccabees 15.36. And again, I know that's not canalytical, but it is a historical book of the Jewish people that I find to be reliable in terms of the history uh, element of it. And so let's look at the characters here. There, there are a few characters. There's even some minor characters whose uh, stories are interesting, but we're not going to go into all that because it can really dredge it out. So I just want to highlight the five main characters that we'll see in this particular story. Now, the first one is Xerxes the first, and I'm going to refer to him through this study as Xerxes, okay? I'm going to just keep it simple. What you'll find, even in the text that I use in the New King James, they actually use his Hebrew name, the name given by the Hebrew people for him, which is Ahashvera. And that is a lot harder to say than Xerxes. So for that very reason, I'm not going to say that every time I come across it in text. So you might even see it on the screen. Understand that that is the same individual as Xerxes. Xerxes is his Greek name. He actually has a Parisian name that I can't even begin to say, so I'm not going to attempt to say it. So as we go through our study, I will refer to him as Xerxes only because it's so much easier. It rolls off the tongue. Then we also have Vesti. Vesti is the second individual that is revealed in this story. And Vesti, as you know, is the queen of King Xerxes. Her Greek name is Amistris. And Amistris actually means beautiful. And we'll see a little bit about that in the story that we're going to read tonight as we study through it. It talks about the fact that she's beautiful. Uh, she also is the one who gives birth to to Xerxes' successor, which is Artaxerxes. For our historians, that kind of gives you a little perspective there. Uh, and then we have Mordecai. Mordecai, which is actually pronounced Mordehai, but again, it's easier to say Mordecai because that's what we say, uh, is going to be a prominent figure throughout the book almost as much as Esther herself will be. Now, Esther's Jewish name, which is only recorded one time throughout the entire text, is Hadassah. Hadassah is her Hebrew name, which means myrtle. And for those who don't remember, myrtle is literally provision in the wilderness. And so if you were to go back and to study uh, what was said through many of the Old Testament books, God says that he'll replace the emptiness with a myrtle tree, among other trees, but it's provision in the wilderness. I find it, it's interesting that she was taken from her people. Well, actually, her ancestors were taken from her people. She's a nobody here, but God is going to make her provision for her people. And then, of course, you know her Parisian name, which, we, which is actually Esther, but Esther is a lot easier to say, and I know it's not like I'm coughing all the time. And I love this because they changed her name to Esther, which means star. I say star. Now, one thing about the book of Esther that I, I think is really, really fascinating is it a lot of times points towards Jesus and a lot of the elements and symbolism that comes out of this. How can you see Jesus in a star? Jesus was the guide to life. She's going to be used as the guide to save the lives of her people. And again, you're going to see a lot of this reoccur in the life of Esther. And then, of course, we have Haman, Haman, whichever one you want to call it. Uh, and we're just going to say he's a bad guy. We don't have to go much more into that. I think the story will reveal uh, what a bad guy he truly, truly is. 
so with that said, let's just go ahead and go to Esther 1, 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Xerxes, this was the Xerxes who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Xerxes sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Sh- uh, Shushan, I'm going to refer to this as Susa because it's a lot easier, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants. The powers of the Pari- uh, Parisia and Media and the nobles and the princes of the provinces before him And when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. Now, if you know anything about King Xerxes, he's a real human being who literally had a huge impact on the known world historically during his reign as king over Babylon or Prussia, depending on which term you want to use. He's a major figure in history at that time. As a matter of fact, uh, he's even appeared in some and, and, and the Babylonian Empire. And so this is literally set in this time, and he is literally the guy that is in the story. Though I don't think he was seven feet tall with earrings from every part of his body running around everywhere being uh, led in the fa- fashion he was. But I'm just trying to get your mind to where he fits historically into this particular issue. And it's important because this banquet itself precedes those events. Now, he goes twice to take over the Grecian Empire at their height. This is when they're at their pinnacle, and twice he fails. It is one of the few kingdoms he was not able to take over But this story is leading into that particular event or series of events. So it says that his empire extended, and I'm going to put this into modern terms for you and I, because when you say from India to Ethiopia, that's not really what's happening here if you look on on a map. So basically, if you were to look at a modern map from what we would call Western uh, Afghanistan all the way across and it would stop in Turkey, and then it would go down, and it would cross over to Sudan. Sudan, Egypt, and a little bit further down into what possibly could be closer to Ethiopia. But it's telling you the furthest east and the furthest west portions of his reign so that you can get a picture of where all this is going on right now. The capital itself is located in an area called Edom. Edom uh, is a traditional place where many people believe the Garden of Eden was at. And I personally believe it myself through my own study. But it's in Elam that you'll find the modern day city of Shusha in Iran. So if you want to see where these events occurred, you can literally go. There is a place there that's been excavated that where these events occurred, it still exists today. The ruins are still there today. I've not been there Hopefully, it'll be on one of my future trips. But this city is important because this city is also the city in which David, or excuse me, Daniel has the vision of the rams and the goats in Daniel chapter 8. And it's also the city where Nehemiah lived while he was in exile. So you can kind of see how it all draws back together. I think it's important that we see the context. So he's throwing a massive party for six months. That's a pretty big party. I mean, if I can get people in and out on one of my parties in a few hours, I'm happy. I can't imagine trying to throw a party for 180 days, but he does. And he's doing this so that he can try to present both power and wealth so that all of the dignitaries, all the nobles, all the military that is here at this party will support him in his endeavor to go take over Greece. That's why this particular event is going on. As a matter of fact, Herodotus, the Greek historian referred to as the father of history, he writes that this event that is recorded is the same event that he used to build up his vassal leadership to come and take over Greece. So we, again, have 
extra biblical text that supports the events that are going on at this time. So verse 5 says, And when these days were completed, so the 180-day party has now finished, the king made a feast lasting seven days. So he's got seven more days of this party. For all of the people who were present in Susa, the citadel, from uh, great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace, there were white and blue linen curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple on silver rods and marble pillars. Now, this is one thing that always fascinates me is we think that these people are old and archaic and they lived in these really pathetic conditions. But one thing you'll understand the more you study the Middle East and those cultures, there is many people who live very lavish lifestyles, even according to our standard today. So much. Think about what we're about to read here. This is, blows my mind. They had gold, silver on mosaic pavement of alabaster, turquoise, white, and black marble. They served drinks in golden vessels. Now catch this. Each vessel being made different from the other. So these are not factory produced. They're not mass produced. They are hand crafted vessels of gold so that everybody will have something special themselves. And the royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king. According uh, to the law, the drink was not compulsory for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. And so we have all of these grand things going on, this opulent uh, area that they're doing this in. As a matter of fact, it says that they're lay, they laid on couches made of gold and silver. I don't know if, I, if I've ever laid on a couch of gold and silver. I don't know if it was pure gold and silver or if it was just plated. But, I mean, that's something you see in The Godfather, you know. That's something pretty uppity in my book. And so they had these, this very, very showy experience going on. But this time, it's not just for the dignitaries. It's for everybody to come and be a part of his wealth, his prosperity, and his desire to gain a large military advantage is what this is all for. And, of course, he doesn't force anybody to drink. Typically, you would force everybody to drink. The king would command it, and you would simply do it. This is one of those times where he didn't command it. He left it to each person's judgment to do it themselves, according to whatever convictions they had. So he's not trying to force people He's trying to kind of bait people. He's trying to draw them in. He's got a plan. And verse 9 says that Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Xerxes. So now we have had three separate parties, three separate banquets, all to get the favor of his people to go with him to usurp more power and more territory. So this is setting the stage for what happens next. On the seventh day, verse 10, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, we would call that drunk, he commanded Mahayam, Bitztha, Harbana, Biktha, Abiktha, Zethar, and Carcass, seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king, Xerxes, to bring Queen Vashti, before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials. For she was beautiful to behold. So she's probably on the Time magazine, the hottest woman alive kind of thing going on. And it says, but Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious and his anger burned within him. Now, remember, I just set the stage for why the king is having these elaborate get-together parties. He's trying to show off for everybody in his kingdom. And now they're at this point where there's the contest of who has the most beautiful women. Who's got the hottest ladies from their area? And the king says, oh, but the... 
the ladies of Babylon, the Persian women, now they you can't beat those. As a matter of fact, the queen is the most beautiful one that exists. So he's trying to impress everybody. And he says, As a, go ahead and bring her out in the finest. Bring her in her royal crown. We want to show her the best way possible because I'm trying to get everybody to support me. And the queen says, no. Now, the only reason he did it in the first place because he was stupid and drunk, right? I mean, that's really what caused it. If he hadn't been drinking, he probably wouldn't have done it because this was against Parisian etiquette to call the queen to put on a show. And this was probably one of the reasons she said no. We don't know because the Bible doesn't say. But she probably understood that it was not an honorable thing to be presented like a trophy. And so she refuses this, and it makes him so irate. But it wasn't the king who got angriest the most. It was those around the king that concoct this crazy scheme. And this says in verse 13, The king said to the wise men who understood the time. We'll come back to that here in just a minute. For this was the king's manner toward all who knew the law and justice. Those closest to him were Karshian, Shethar, Admatha, uh, Tarshish, Meres, Marcina, and Mumarkin. The seven princes of Persia and Medea who had access to the king's presence and who ranked highest in the kingdom. What shall we do to the queen according to the law because she did not obey the command of the king, Xerxes, brought to her by the eunuchs. So now you have all of these men in power. These are his council. These are his top dogs, his generals, if you will. Those that are ruling over the major provinces that he has. And they have a bigger issue than even the king has. And they said, this cannot go unpunished. This cannot occur. And what happens is he gathers them together. Again, wise men who understood the time. The wise men who understood the time, this is actually an early reference to a group of people that originally was formed in uh, Pharaoh's court, but became also a part of what happened in Babylonian time. And these are what we refer to in Scripture as magi. Anyone Ever heard of a magi? You see another link here to Jesus? Another? Now, these magis were astrologers, and so they would study the stars to come up with an answer to their dilemmas. Now, I'm not sure what stars you study to come up to figure out how do you deal with a rebellious queen. I'm not sure where that comes from, but this is, uh, I don't think what they did. I think that they had other motives, and so they're trying to come up with a way to make things right. In verse 16 says, Then Mebuchadnezzar answered before the king and the princess. Now he's the last one listed among the list that I just mentioned. And what typically happened in this culture at this time was when the king would ask for advice, he would always start with the last ranking individual, the last person, the lowest person on the totem pole to give advice first. That way, if he didn't like the advice that he received from that guy, he had other people to go through. But once you get to the top guys, you don't ask down. You always ask up. And this guy at the very bottom of the list makes this statement. He said, Queen Vashti has not only wronged the king, but also all of the princes and all the people who are in the providence of King Xerxes. For the queen's behavior will become known to all women so that they will despise their husbands in their eyes when they report King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she did not come. They were worried about a feminist revolution. They did not want to lose power and control. They didn't want the women to rise up and say, well, hold on. If the queen can do it to the king, then you don't have any right to tell me what to do. And so they're not so much worried about the king himself as they don't want to lose the power in their provinces and their own homes. 
And it says, This very day the noble ladies of Persia and Medea will say to the king's officials that they have heard of the behavior of the queen. Thus there will be excessive contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal decree go out from him. Let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will be not be altered. That's important. What they're literally telling him to do is to make a king's decree, a king's law. And in the Babylonian Empire, when a king made a law, it was law. It wasn't changed. You'll probably remember that this is the same type of thing we heard when we hear about Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. Remember, the king loved Daniel, but he had created a law because of the deception of the magi that he was following at that time. And they said, oh, but nobody should worship uh, any other god, only you, only your statue. And he says, you're right, it shouldn't happen. And what happens? Daniel goes, unashamed, opens the windows, and the king's heart's broke. We see that in the, in the book of Daniel. His heart is broke, but he, could, he couldn't do anything to stop it. He couldn't change it. He had to let the process play out. Of course, we know that God played that process out very well. It's the same thing that happens when we think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A decree was made. Once he made it, he couldn't change it. It was set in stone. And so this is literally the deception that they're using against him. It shouldn't be altered that Vashti shall come no more before King Xerxes and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. And when the king's decree which he had made is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great, all wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. So you can see a little bit of manipulation going on right here among his own people. You know, one thing about being a king at this uh, point in history was a dangerous thing to be in the position of the king. Family members would kill you if you were king. Loyal subjects would kill you if you were king. They're always looking for an upper hand. So he cannot get out of doing what he decides to do. And verse 21 says, And the reply pleased the king and the princess, and the king did according to the word of Memekin. And then he sent letters to all the provinces, to each province in his own script, and to every people in their own language, that each man should do, excuse me, should be master of his own house and speak the language of his own people. So let's go to chapter 2 real quick. Chapter 2 picks up by saying, After these things, when the wrath of King Xerxes subsided, he remembered Vashti. After what things? What things are we talking about here? What is occurring? What has gone on here? Well, what has happened is there is a period of four, about four years from the end of chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2 that has occurred. And what has happened in that span of four years, remember, he was trying to go do what? Go take over the Greeks. He was going to go try to take their empire. Remember, I told you twice he failed. During this four years, he has these campaigns to go take on the Grecians. From the end of chapter 1 to the beginning of chapter 2. Now he's coming back. Defeated. Depleted. He's unsuccessful in his conquest. And it says that he remembered Vashti. So as soon as he comes back defeated, he begins to immediately think of the one person who was most dedicated to him but he can't even go to her. He had put a separation by making that decree that he could never, ever have her back. Remember, this is the mother of his child who would be the king after he dies. Well, after he's assassinated. And so he wants to seek counsel. He wants to, to but he can't. He's locked into the words that he said. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful women, young virgins, to Susa the citadel, and to the woman's quarter under the custody of Haggai, the king's unit, custody 
excuse me, custodian of the women, and let beautiful preparation be given them. Then let the young women who please the king be queen instead of Ashti. These things pleased the king, and he did so. Well, I'm sure we could all figure out why it pleased the king, because women had no value, and he was going to get to have women every night as often as he wanted, and he didn't care. And so we have this story of this evil king, which we know historically he was evil. But God is going to put in the path of this evil king a righteous queen. And it's kind of like God when we deal with sin. Sin all around us, and the Bible says where there's sin, that there much more is righteousness. And so there has to be this counterbalance. So we see this evil, crooked, manipulative king, and we're going to see rise up this innocent, righteous virgin that God will use to do a glorious feat among his people. And so verse 5 says, In Susa the city there, there was a certain Jew. Remember what I say, when the Bible says a certain person, it means there's a very specific person. So far, God has been sovereign. He's beginning to work in the life of Esther, and he does that through the life of her cousin, Mordecai. He's a certain Jew. And the reason this is, we'll find out as we look further these next couple weeks, is because he's a righteous Jew. And this is a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemel, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. That's important. They don't put all that in there without there being a significance to this. His great-grandfather, Kish, is the individual who was brought into captivity from Jerusalem. We'll see that here in a minute as we read on. But he's also... A Benjamite. Does anyone understand the significance of Kish and Benjamite? For those who may not, let me go ahead and fill in the blanks for you. Kish, whether it's this individual or not, I doubt it is because of the time that this happened. But the name is a direct reference to the father of King Saul. So this individual is in the lineage of King Saul. He's a Benjamite, which we know that King Saul was. And they call this out because even after everything that would happen with Saul, God still has a great plan through that family. And so he uses this family at this moment. And Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem and the captives who had been captured with Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, which we know was the evil king that had his eyes plugged out by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. And so he's literally adopting, as she, he's becoming <coughs> the godfather of his cousin, In exile. Now understand, again, this is all occurring after Ezra has gone to rebuild the temple of God. You remember some went with him to rebuild the temple. Well, what happened to those that didn't go? This is the story we'll read as we begin to unfold the life of Mordecai and Esther. Verse 8 says, So it was that the king commanded the decrees were heard. When many young women were gathered to Susa, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, and Esther also was taken to the king's palace in the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, this is referring to Esther, and she obtained his favor. You see, when God is working in a situation, when God is having his will and his way, and when he's working in a sovereign nature, The scripture tells us he will raise us up in due time. A nobody, Jewish slave girl, will be raised up in due time. In due time will be a little process for this to occur. And so she has to go through, verse 9, 
uh, the beautification preparation to her besides her allowance. The seven choice maidservants were provided to her by the king's palace. And he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Tradition says that there were 400 women brought from all over the empire for him to choose from. And he would, he would take them one at a time and pick from them one at a time. And then there would be this decision whether they would become a queen or essentially be locked in a harem for the rest of their life, never to see their family again, never to go, never to go anywhere. They were just there for the king's pleasure. But verse 10 says, Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And every day Mordecai placed in front of the court of the woman's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare. You see, God had specifically told Mordecai that she was not to reveal who she was. Because as she revealed who she was, she would not have risen to queen. She would have been put back into the lower status. The Jewish people at the time of Xerxes were considered the scum of the earth. That's why Haman has the response that we'll read about from Haman is because they have no uh, identity that is elevated in their culture. And they are completely ostracized. And so for that reason, uh, he says, don't say anything now. Even though they were ostracized, what I love about this is God will take both Mordecai and Esther and give them divine favor for his glory. Amen? So let's wrap this up in the last few verses that we'll cover tonight. Verse 12. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes after she had completed 12 months preparation. Now, ladies, y'all might like the way this sounds, but we're going to talk about this here. According to the regulation of the women, for there was the days of preparation appointed six months with oil and myrrh. And six months with perfume and preparation for beautifying women. So for six months, it seems like this is an ideal situation. She's going to literally get to go to a spa on a day-by-day -day basis, be rubbed down with oils, rubbed down with lotions, rubbed down with all these great things so that she gets to enjoy it. She's learning what it means to be queen because if she's picked, she's got to be able to immediately go into that role. But she's being pampered, right? That's what it sounds like. Sounds like to me, massage envy going on right there. But really what's happening is she's, she's having all this done to her to make her acceptable before the king. You see, myrrh was used. Uh, it, was, it was considered to have medicinal purposes at that time. And it was used to smooth out the skin. Now, think about this. If you live in a dry, arid place, uh, you're, even at a pretty early age, you're going to have dry and cracked skin. You know what I'm talking about. It's going to be not very pretty. And I'm sure some of these girls didn't come from upper echelon. They were chosen for their beauty. They probably came out of the fields. They had a great appearance to them, but they were a little scaly. Okay, we'll just put it that way. And so they're trying to doll her up trying to make her look good because when she goes before the king, she needs to smell good. She needs to look good. She needs to be soft to the touch. She's got to be the ideal woman. And so this process goes on, and eventually she's called in to the king. And when she's called in to the king, he finds favor with her. And I'm just summarizing to wrap this up. She finds favor with her. And by the sovereign power of God, she's elevated to a position where he has positioned her to save his people. And so we're going to pick back up as we'll talk about this for a few more weeks. And uh, I promise you it gets a lot better. I said I had to set the foundation tonight. But the next uh, few studies will actually go in a lot more uh, great detail about the story of Mordecai, about the story of Esther, and you'll see the divine hand of God as he moves and orchestrates so that his will to save is done. This is another foreshadow of Jesus Christ. 
This time, though, again, it's spectacular because he does it through a woman, which you you almost will never find in ancient writings of any kind a woman who saves her civilization. Uh, there's probably one or two I can think of. So this is, again, a very rare occurrence and the only one that God does through his people. So why don't we just stand to our feet tonight and let's just take the next few minutes and just praise God because God is sovereign. Amen. He doesn't need our permission to make things happen.